So, um, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to um, introduce you today to Dr. Aleida Bertrand. She is uh, she holds a PhD on cultural theory from the uh, Latin Academy of Arts. Am I saying that correctly? Culture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, of culture, sorry, the Latin Academy of Culture. And uh, this is the second of uh, two lectures that uh, they are um, being celebrated in the Baltic area. The first was yesterday in Helsinki. And this little cycle of lectures is a result of a joint effort uh, from the Institute Ramon Llull and the Institute for the Promotion of Catalan Cultural Language Abroad. Uh, and we have also received the support of the University of Helsinki, of course, the Estonian Literary Museum, and finally from the um, Estonian Association of Spanish Scientists. So uh, today, Dr. Aleda Bertrand is going to talk about international folk festivals, nation building and transnationalism. And this is uh, I think a very exciting comparative study between Latvia and uh, Northern Catalonia. So welcome and please enjoy. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, thanks to the Sun Literary Museum for your interest in this very, uh, I would say, uh, niche topic. And, uh, and thanks to all the organizations that FIDEM has mentioned and also to FIDEM for uh, <laughs> the, the warm welcome here. And well, um, today I will be presenting the, the main findings of my doctoral dissertation that I defended last winter. And since I assume that the audience of today is already acquainted with the geographical location and the main historical facts of Latvia, I will begin by introducing the region of my second case study, and it's called Northern Catalonia. And Northern Catalonia currently constitutes uh, France Department of the Eastern Pyrenees. And it's currently a frontier, a border between France and Spain. And um, this region was a powerful periphery of the Catalan federal state from the Middle East, in the Middle Ages, until it was annexed to France through the Treaty of the Pyrenees in, uh, in 1659. And you should know that in the 10th century, the, the capital of Northern Catalonia, Perpignan, um, was the, the second most powerful capital of Middle Age Catalonia. However, um, with, the 17, with the 17th century annexation to France, of course, the region starts to undergo a process of um, political and cultural assimilation, although the activists the activism there remains. And actually, the, the Catalan national identity has endured um, all the centuries, and it's still present. And also, um, in the 18th century, the Northern Catalan community tried to maintain a diplomatic relationship with France to ensure the continuity of their own uh, cultural practices and even socio-political institutions. Um, however, um, by the late 18th century and, and 19th century, with the uh, construction of France as a nation state, um, the region undergoes a more, uh, um, let's say, a more, it increasingly becomes uh, French in the sense that, for instance, only the French language is spoken in the public space, and then the Catalan language becomes the language of the indoors within the family and within friends. So there is this process of cultural and political assimilation that, um, that becomes very present. And um, actually, uh, let's say that since they, they maintain this sense of Catalan identity and uh, Catalan national spirit, they, in the 20th century, there are documents that actually show how um, Northern Catalans wanted to, they were interested in pursuing the, the freedom of, of, of Catalonia as a nation. Um, and, and there are, uh, as I said, documents that prove that. However, uh, there is a turning point, and it's that uh, during the First World War, uh, the, the local people of Northern Catalonia, they had to fight uh, with the French army. 
And that participation within the army led to forge them sentiments of belonging with the French nation and the Republican spirit of France. And that created a sort of paradox between um, within them. And it's true that in that period, there is this, this sense of contradictory feelings in terms of national identity. Um, however, uh, with the Spanish Civil War and the previous dictatorship of Primo de Rivera, there are significant waves of uh, Catalan people from Southern Catalonia that actually migrate to Northern Catalonia for uh, just to exile, basically, because they were, uh, of course, prosecuted for um, being Republicans and having fought uh, against the, the Spanish nationalists. So there is this massive immigration of Catalan people to Northern Catalonia. And during the first period, these people were placed in concentration camps. And after a while, they were absorbed within the French society. But uh, this amount of people that were now present yeah, in, the, in, this, uh, in this part of Northern Catalonia actually uh, allowed to revive the sentiment of belonging to Catalonia. Because now they had people that were very compromised, they were activists, that were actually encouraging the local people to pursue uh, and to protect the Catalan national uh, identity sentiment. And after having um, summarized a little bit the, the main, the main uh, progress of national identity in the region, I will uh, start to um, frame my research. So, um, my idea was to compare two case studies, the International Folk Festival Baltica in, in Latvia and also in, in Lithuania and Estonia, but to a lesser degree, and uh, this, the um, International Sardana Festival of Saret uh, in Northern Catalonia. And what I realized is that there was, there was already uh, a work existing um, that covered the, the main historical facts of this of these uh, festivals and especially the the social movements in which they participated in the case of the Baltica festival it was a single revolution however there was no um, research on the transnational dimensions of these festivals because when we talk about international folk festivals um, the the label of international, has a connotation, and in these cases, it had a political connotation, as I will, I will show in a minute. And I was, I was also focusing on these, on the dimensions of speciality and temporality, which are dimensions that are usually neglected in, uh, in festival studies. And my idea was to provide a novel, um, or at least attempt to provide a novel outlook on the topic by analyzing the case studies as cultural and political borderlands and also the regions that uh, in which they were being celebrated. And if you are not very familiar with the idea of cultural nationalism, um, I will provide you with some facts or at least some uh, notions of it. And that I'm showing this is like because my, um, my research departs from the fact that when I moved to Latvia, I realized that there were some similarities with Catalonia in terms of national identity building that started in the period of cultural nationalism, which emerges at the end of the 18th century and beginnings of the 19th century. And it can be defined as ideas and practices that relate to the intentional revival of the culture of a purported national community. And the aim of cultural nationalism is to frame the nation as a moral community with its own identity, past and destiny, as imagined by the local intelligentsia. And the rationale of cultural nationalism could be uh, defined as that the bonds of the people or related peoples are forged through a shared cultural heritage, such as history, language, songs, ideology, symbols, literature, religion, or land. So this is the point of departure for my, um, for my thesis. And then from this, from this idea of cultural nationalism, I start to note the similarities between Latvia and Catalonia to actually check if they can become uh, 
comparative case studies, if, if I can actually compare them. And what I found out is that both regions had undergone uh, similar processes in terms, for example, of industrialization. Actually, this is to me the catalyst of cultural nationalism. Both Latvia and Northern Catalonia had been uh, heavily uh, industrialized, and that allowed, as it says here, of an emergence of an intellectual and literate society. There was a, a bourgeoisie that was actually accessing um, the university, for instance. In Latvia, under the rule of the Baltic Germans, there was a first generation of illustrated uh, Latvians or Latophiles, and they studied at universities of the Russian Empire in Germany, and they became the engine of the Latvian first awakening, and that was the, the birth of Latvia as a cultural nation, and they focused on the research and promotion of the Latvian language and culture, um, that, and that were the goals of their, um, within the national agenda that they had. And uh, following a similar pattern, uh, the Northern Catalan society was uh, also carried out during the first half of the 19th century. And under the rule of the French nation state, Northern Catalan literati, so the intelligentsia, they faced some contradictions because they, they found themselves in a betwixt and between situation. And they were, um, and that situation can be illustrated with the concept of Catalan de France. So they were considered Catalans from France, but not purely French, of course. And they were certainly not pleased with the mistreatment of Catalan language because it was called as patois, which means a coarse or uncultivated language. And uh, they went, they definitely wanted to become different from, from, from the French, and they didn't want to be mistaken by Spaniards or Occitans as well. So um, what happens in this period is that this, uh, this society of youngsters that go to university, that they are interested in, in building um, the nation from the cultivation of culture, uh, they start to engage in cultural associations. And this, uh, this participation elevates, as it says here, the idea of a, a national culture and also this it fosters um, this sentiment of, of belongings. And um, I think it's also important to note that uh, that participation consists on producing literary works, translations, um, and, and also creating a, a Catalan national, sorry, a Latvian Catalan national consciousness um, within the, the sphere of an illustrated uh, bourgeoisie. And also the ideas are spread through newspapers and, and organizations that are founded by in that period. There is also a similarity in terms of architecture and art because both regions were mainly focused on um, Art Nouveau and they were mirroring themselves to the to Western Europe. And actually that um, artistic production sets them apart from the neighboring the neighboring countries. So that allows them to give also a distinct sense of identity. And also it's um, they both have a very strong choir singing tradition. In the case of Latvia, it started to develop in the 16th century through the Lutheran musical traditions and it became a well-established practice in the 18th century. Um, always from this uh, German choir singing tradition. And in the case of uh, Northern Catalonia, the choir singing crystallizes into the creation of Orpheums that were inspired by the mid 19th century Flemish choral movement that uh, aimed to reinvigorate the Dutch language against the dominating French language and glorify the, the region's past. And then also we have folklorist research. Um, it's, it's interesting that since both places are very, they were significantly um, industrialized, that uh, triggered an interest in, um, in building the national identity also from the idea of salvaging traditions and also um, trying to, to keep that world that is uh, increasingly vanishing at a very fast pace. And, and in both places, folklorists that say that they act as the cultural mediators between the intangible heritage of peasant communities 
and the language of the educated spheres. And the main goal was to find the essence of the national culture by exploring the customs of the local peasantry. Uh, this is Latvia in the early 20th century, and in Latvia, the greatest exponent of folklorist production was Christianis Barons, who classified existing ethnographic material and, and compiled it in these volumes of Latvian dinosaur folk songs. You may <laughs> know this very well. Uh, and on, on the right, we have the cabinet of folk songs. And this is Northern Catalonia in the early 20th century. And um, it's, it's interesting that uh, in, in Northern Catalonia, uh, it's basically in this period where a new tradition emerges. And it's um, what is called an invented tradition. So you may be already aware with this concept of invented tradition. But uh, the, the, the Sardana, which is both the, um, uh, the music that you see here, there is a cobla. A cobla is a group of um, musicians. And then there is the Sardana as a dance in circle, as you can see on the right. And this, uh, this type of dance, traditional dance, um, it, it, it already existed before the, the, uh, the 19th century and the 20th century, but in a much shorter form. And actually, Pep Ventura, this, this man that you see here, he um, was a sort of self-made ethnomusicologist at that time, and he introduced um, new, new instruments, and he uh, actually made longer compositions of sardanas and created uh, many, um, many new types of, uh, of sardana uh, songs. And the Sardana was quickly, it was adapted very quickly within the bourgeoisie and also the, the popular classes uh, of society. And it became to represent very quickly the national dance of Catalonia. So um, in, in Northern Catalonia, uh, the process of adopting the Sardana, since it was, it belonged to the Southern Catalonia, it started in the early 20th century and it started as basically um, some dances that were uh, being played in the halls. Uh, and it was just pure leisure. And then it quickly began uh, to become also a symbol of um, national cultural resistance because it was a Catalan tradition, a Catalan dance, Catalan music. And it represented the spirit of the people because the fact of holding hands in a circle, uh, it, uh, it triggers the sentiments of harmony, of uh, a united uh, people and, um, and, and also the reflection of a peaceful society. And you may be wondering then what is the connection with, with international folk festivals? So my point of departure for my thesis was uh, we have these fathers of the modern folk nation, Cristianis Barones, Pep Ventura in the case of Northern Catalonia, and then we have um, postmodern phenomena, which are international folk festivals, which emerged in the 1960s and in the 1970s. And a clear example of this is, for example, the, the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival that you can find in Washington, DC. And this, these festivals are multilayered phenomena, and they emerge to find uh, some meaning in the in a mass uh, popular culture and, and, and capitalist society. They wanted to celebrate diversity. There was a preoccupation with the representation of cultural minorities and also this idea of, of utopia. They wanted to present an alternative society within the, 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 the time frame of the festival. And uh, my idea was that uh, whether international folk festivals that had a political agenda and the people that created these festival communities were actually following the same pattern that uh, cultural nationalists were doing uh, during that time of cultural nationalism. And actually, the case studies that I was researching had several um, similarities and characteristics. And they were complex because they were international folk festivals. That means that they were not mere representations of local folklore. They were also inviting international guests. So it was 
a much more complex phenomenon. Then also it had a political agenda and it was very clear. They had this um, idea of pursuing or contributing to the pursuit of national independence. And also they emerged in national identity building processes that uh, opposed to an other. So there was a sense of an occupier and we need to challenge the narrative of, of that other. And also they were facing challenges in terms of representation and recognition because there was a censorship. There was not a free speech and they also had to negotiate that. And uh, the first case study, as I said before, is the International Folklore Festival Baltica. Here you have some pictures and a quick timeline. Um, the, the idea of the festival emerges um, in during a CIO FF uh, World Congress that was held in, in Tallinn, in Estonia in 1985. And it was the idea of one of the delegates of the CIOFF, which is a, a network of folklore associated now with UNESCO. And in 1987, the festival takes place in Lithuania under the flagships of authenticity, kinship and voting unity. And I always like to remind people that there are not a lot of cases of festivals that uh, emerge as a, with a sense of cooperation, Baltic cooperation, and that have endured uh, throughout all these years after the transition into democracy. And then in 1988, there is a, a big event because the, uh, during the parade of the, of the Baltica festival in Latvia, uh, the, the, the folklorists and, and also um, musicians and folk participants they were carrying the Baltic national flags that were banned, and that was um, a milestone in international event. And then, as you can see here, there was the association uh, Baltic that was founded. There was a cooperation agreement with the Nordic Association, and they acquired full membership with the CIO network. And that allowed them to develop a sense of cultural diplomacy. What they wanted to do is to obtain the recognition of the CIOFF to see if they could actually contribute to this process of emancipation and also find allies that could contribute to the um, recognition of, of the countries uh, that they were involved in. And of course, the Latin folklore movement um, was not, uh, um, it, it was a reaction to the, uh, some of the get them most, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, of course, uh, there was a reaction to the imposed amateur Soviet folklore um, that um, it was portrayed as a representation of the Soviet people. And what, they, what the Latvians wanted to do was to counteract this and to actually portray a sense of authenticity. So they were in hands of producing their own folklore. And what they did was a re reinvention of the tradition they were actually uh, salvaging uh, ways of doing folklore from the past and then introducing new elements and um, also playing with instruments and finding new ways to convey a genuine uh, way of, of folklore, of authentic folklore. However, it should be noted that the main thing, the main, the main factor that connects the three Baltic countries is the polyphonic singing. And this is the oldest trait that they have uh, in terms of authentic folklore, but they created the whole universe around this concept. And the second case study, it's the International Sardana of Saret. And what you should know is that it began in 1956 when Jelen Sturaniwebon, who was an activist and border crosser, settled in Saret and started teaching Sardanas. Jelen Sturen was a Catalan Republican who uh, was very had a, a very high degree of national consciousness and he started teaching Sardanas to the younger generations there. They founded uh, an association for Sardanas in the next year and then the following year the festival of Saret is inaugurated. Saret is a small city quite close to Perpignan and, um, and also it's through that the festival's president is that Vidalou who has been the president for a long long time he founded the Federation for the Defense of the Catalan Language and Culture in Catalonia. So we're talking about 
a series of activists and Vidalou, for instance, he is the son of Catalan uh, refugees, so Catalan immigrants to Northern Catalonia that they fled uh, the country um, during after the, the Spanish Civil War. And, and also he published his memoirs in Places Sardana, and this is something that I also analyzed in my, in my thesis. So if I wanted to, my, my, my main concern was how can I actually make sense of this transnational dimension? Because what I realized is that when we're talking about international folk festivals, the international label was an instrument to actually unite several people within the same place during the festival time and counteract censorship. In the case of Staret, as you can see here, in the case of Staret, uh, the international label was an excuse for Southern Catalans to travel by bus to Northern Catalonia, and we're talking about Sardana dancers, and dance together. And for them, it was an experience that was uh, very profound because they could actually be in a place where they could speak Catalan within that period of time. There were Catalan flags that they couldn't see at home because the Franco censorship didn't allow that. And it was a moment of gathering with old friends and also um, relatives. So the international label was an excuse to challenge the uh, the, the borders and to challenge the, the censorship of, of, uh, of, of Spain in that period. And the same thing happened with um, the Baltica festival. It was an excuse to also find a common place for the Baltic people to be and also to join, to also welcome the international um, uh, guests that could actually learn about the hardships of the Soviet Union while joining the festival. So this is something important to take into account. And my idea was, OK, I'm very interested in exploring this international label as a form of transgression. And I came up with this theoretical framework, um, and it's called Counter Hegemonic Borderscapes. It's the theoretical framework proposed by Karen Brambilla in 2015. So it's quite recent, and it is uh, it emerges within cultural border studies, which is also a rather emerging new field because um, let's say that border studies were neglecting the cultural part of it. Because uh, as you can see here, culture and art can actually articulate political dissent. It can become an instrument for contesting narratives and it's a form of soft power. But uh, interestingly, uh, border studies have focus on other aspects such as um, the hardships of migration without considering the cultural production of, of, those, um, of those processes. And also it's interesting because counter hegemonic borderscapes can actually allow to understand how um, national identity building processes can challenge the, the, the narratives or the grand narratives of an other, so of an, of an oppressor and also how communities that participate in this idea of counter hegemonic borderscapes face challenges in terms of representation and recognition. So uh, just to, um, this is a very visual uh, way to understand how the idea of borderscapes um, works. So a borderscape is a space, but also generates an experience, and that experience is filled with, or, or even produced through imagination, and this is a loop. So uh, all these aspects are interconnected. And I think that this fits very well the idea of a festival, which produces a space, it produces an experience, and also it allows uh, for Im imagination because a festival is produced through a creative process. It, it, uh, obviously there is the, the aesthetic part, but also the content of the festival program and the representation of it. So there are many dimensions and there are, there are creative dimensions within this aspect. And the key research questions within my thesis were, what would be the outcome of interpreting the transnational dimensions of the festivals as counter-hegemonic borderscapes 
which act as spaces for liberating the political imagination and spaces of becoming. And um, I, I, I've put spaces of becoming in italics because what Calabria and Villa proposes is that uh, we can understand country hegemonic borderscapes as producing places of becoming, but I thought that in the case of festivals, it's more a spaces of becoming because um, a, a place has a more, let's say, um, no, I'm not going to say static, but it's definitely more rooted in the idea of history, culture, identity, whereas um, a, a festival is a, a fleeting phenomenon, it's a temporary phenomenon, and it allows for a more uh, dynamic uh, sense of, um, of developing cultural practices. And the second question was, beyond this, since the festival community celebrating the case studies have used collective imagination processes following the steps of the fathers of the modern folk nations, is there an invisible thread connecting cultural nationalism with postmodernity? Because what I realized is that the, the way that they were, the, the people that were in, into these festival communities, they were activists, they, they had the idea of building um, let's say, of, of national identity building and contrib contributing to that, but they were using resources that were from, that were actually based on postmodern society, such as technology. The fact that uh, an international folk festival is a stage and also that there, there is also the, um, uh, of course, the role of, of television and the whole experience is a, it's a, uh, an experience close to a mass popular uh, phenomenon, although it's not the same, but it definitely has elements to it. And within this idea of counter hegemonic board escapes, I was analyzing two dimensions, the narrative one and the performative one. And for instance, um, if we look at the narrative dimensions, we can see that the festivals can be understood as manifestos, not pure festival programs, because they actually have a narrative program and they had a very clear idea of distinguishing themselves from another. And the festival's narratives from this fest of these case studies were heavily focused on the idea of family as a metaphor. So we belong to this family of Baltic cultures, we belong to this family of Catalan um, uh, dancers and the idea of nation as body and, and, and nature. So there is always a, a metaphoric way of framing the nation. And also the festival narratives fostered a pan-identity. So there was a, a, this idea of a transnational identity. In the case of the Baltic, it was a Baltic identity. And in the case of Catalonia, a pan-Catalanism. This idea of Catalan countries, which is a, a, a political project that says that all the Catalan speaking regions, so Northern Catalonia, Catalonia, Valencia, Balearic Islands, Pialguero in Italy, those places that speak Catalan can actually be considered Catalan countries. And also from narrative dimensions, I found out that um, the cultural hegemony from uh, the Soviet Union and in the case of, of from Catalonia, from Spain and France, uh, was, contested, was contested through metaphorical text that required reading between the lines. And also, um, it was successful because journalists became activists in develop, developing emotional texts, and especially in, in the case of Latvia, activists, uh, sorry, journalists in 1988 uh, with the Perestroika, they begin to engage in very emotional narratives and actually participate in the folk scene as observers, but at the same time, they encourage people to go out in the streets and participate in the whole singing revolution. And it's true that in those places, there are also differences in terms of visibility and invisibility. Why? Because um, that's it, the, the, in the case of the Baltic countries, there, were, there was a moment of, there was a cultural explosion and there was an interest also from the West from what was happening, whereas in Northern Catalonia, the situation has been different. 
there was no, there were less possibilities of actually pursuing national independence, and they were much more invisibilized um, within the media and so on. And also, I would like to explain to you that my research consisted on uh, ethnographic methodology based on, on observation, semi-structure interviews, and archival research. And I was basically doing um, ethnographic field work, and I found out that um, in this performative dimension, it was very important, or the, the festival really focused on the idea of uh, an idyllic community, the portrayal of a utopic idyllic community. At the same time, that it was an, an active form of, of remembering uh, and, and developing cultural memory on the festival uh, founders and also the festival um, participants. Also, I researched the, the museum aspect of it, the representation within museums, and how the festival Baltica, for example, is still uh, something that um, represents the spirit of the singing revolution and that it, it still it still wants to be remembered within society. And also, um, it's true that my, my thesis was a bit uh, affected by the pandemic. However, um, I realized that during, the, during 2021, the Baltica Festival could not be celebrated, but it could be celebrated online. So each national cultural center was holding the festival separately but at the same time united by the same screen in, in a synchronous way and this type of festival um, also counted with the participation of folklorists that had not been engaged in the festival for a long time so they were active again and they participated they were dancing synchronously in the in the virtual space they were also um, workshops and this is also part of my field work in Northern Catalonia. And what I found out is that um, the festival was not celebrated anymore in the in the um, bullfighting um, ring that used to be celebrated traditionally since its beginning. Um, when I went there, I realized that the festival had less funding and they were forced to um, celebrate the Sardana contest that they have um, in, in the square, in the public square. However, there was a much more intense representation of Catalan national identity because it was the moment of the process, so the, the, the post-referendum uh, uh, moment, and, and um, there was a lot of sense of um, moral injustice, and people were more, uh, let's say, it was an intense moment for, for the representation of Catalan national symbols. And what I found out from this performative dimension is that, as I said before, this, this festival communities focus on the idea of an idyllic space against an oppressive space, that they wanted to portray a whole way of life. It was also this idea of being a community that is different and that, and that also has a a different way of doing through the representation of authentic folklore, that they were in a situation of ambiguous liminality, especially, uh, especially in Northern Catalonia, but also the Baltica Festival, because it also has less audience now than before, it's less popular, although the participants really engage with the idea of the Baltica Festival. And of course, there is always this, um, let's say, uncertainty about the future, and because it it tells the collaboration of the three Baltic countries, and also the fact that the cultural production could be seen as a continuation of cultural nationalism in many ways. And also that these festivals showed a solidarity network, and uh, they incorporated participants into the body. The fact that, that these communities are always in touch with all participants, what they do is that they, um, uh, in a way, instill a sense of responsibility and belonging within the festival community that uh, that endures throughout time, and that also that they share their alternative cultural universe that can be understood as an expression of cultural democracy within uh, situations that sometimes are not don't feel such democratic or such open as in the case of 
northern Catalonia, and also that the the another function of these festivals was to safeguard intangible cultural heritage by producing a new layer of creative culture. And I think that if we understand, for example, the national culture of Latvia as layered, we can understand that the idea of folklore can be represented with old traditions such as the song and dance celebration, but also through the Baltica festival because it's, it's in a scene of authentic folklore. So it means that the nation and, and the, the community of, of Latvia and the people involved in the folklore scene have several ways of expressing themselves and they have also different ways of uh, interpreting their sense of traditional culture. And also, I'm not going to delve into it, but I also did some research on on the temporal aspect of the festival. So how the festivals, which was the activity of the festivals during the high peaks of political activity. And I, I realized that in both places there were moments of creative momentum. So when there was a political opportunity, a window of opportunity, the festivals acted very intensely very engaging and contributing to a lot of narratives and that could be understood as a creative explosion that the concept uh, coined by Yuri Lotman and also after this phase comes an adjustment or settlement phase in which the festival becomes more stable there is a more a more stable sociopolitical um, activity as well and then a transformation in which uh, the festival definitely begins to uh, shape again. And in the case of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Baltica festival, the transformation could be understood with the pandemic form. When the festival went online, it reinvented itself, although the festival was very stable because for 30 years, the Baltica festival has run uh, in the very same way with the CIO FF support. Uh, however, there was this moment of uncertainty that led to a transformation. And in the case of the Northern Catalonia, the transformation happened when the festival took place in the public square, because suddenly the festival had to um, frame itself again with a different narrative. And as conclusions, uh, this is very broad because I cannot uh, say that my thesis is quite dense, but as conclusions, I really encourage people that are interested in the topic to not look just at the, at the micro perspective, but also the macro perspective at the, at the timeline of the sociocultural movements that are and social political movements that allow folklore to develop in different ways. And also that uh, this kind of um, international folk festivals with a political agenda reveal a political commitment and commemorative spirit and the audience also shares this sense of camaraderie because they have participated all together in moments of uh, intense emotional activity as well. And also the fact that these kind of festivals are key sites for nation building and also they are platforms for revealing the creative capacity of festival communities. So it's also a very interesting opportunity for understanding processes of creativity and also that the international label of the festivals um, acts as a resource for providing buffer zones to exercise nonviolent resistance in times of political and sociopolitical crisis. And this is everything. So thank you very much for listening and I will be very happy to answer your questions. It's time for questions and answers. So, anyone? Could you talk about uh, postmodernity in context of uh, your research? I don't understand uh, uh, how uh, postmodernity conception uh, could be used uh, for festival because uh, mm -hmm. festival is uh, very popular. Uh, popular form of activity in this period. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, folk festivals and uh, it was uh, Woodstock, it was uh, Moscow festival, 
and uh, etc. etc. But I'm not sure that it is uh, post-modernity activities. Mm -hmm. it, it's very, very different, difficult for 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 me. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, this is I think this is the most perhaps um, controversial uh, aspect of my thesis. Um, but I want to to at least explore that possibility. And it's a fact. It's not purely the the international food festival. My, my goal was to uh, see if there was an invisible threat, as I said, connecting cultural nationalism. Why? Because in postmodernity, there is also the emergence of, for example, the middle class, right? So in the 1960s, there is now a generation that can go to university and can access and, 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 and can actually upgrade uh, within a new social and intellectual status. And actually, a lot of these folkways and, and, and ethnomusicologies that I found within my case studies were coming from this background. So um, also the fact that the, the people involved in these folk festivals were not merely uh, reproducing authentic folklore. They were actually um, researchers. They published actually um, academic research on this topic. So for me, it was a way of cultivating cultivating culture, but also within the framework of universities and, and post the postmodern world. When I'm talking about postmodernity, I'm talking about from the mid 1950s onwards. So this the second half of the of the 20th century, and and also the fact that um, most of these folklorists um, actually used technological devices such as recording tools for going to the they went to the countryside and recorded uh, all of these uh, um, folk songs. Uh, but there was always this technological dimension, this technological aspect that of course in cultural nationalism obviously it wasn't. Um, and that's why I thought that I could I, I, I had to place this um, this way of understanding um, folklore research and also folklore production within uh, the postmodern world because the context was actually the context shaped the way that uh, the the folk songs that the festival reproduced uh, were recorded and and and, and archived and so on. So um, to me, it was important to give it the context. Of course, uh, there is a debate on whether this is a, a good solution or not. Um, but I definitely thought that the these international folk festivals had to be some some in some way differentiated from traditions such as song and dance celebration, which have a long, long history, and that was a bit my my idea. Oh, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I think it's. Uh... Uh, no, but uh, uh, cultural uh, cultural nationalism is a current narrative. Mm -hmm. It is not uh, postmodernity uh, uh, minor minor narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, not post uh, modern conception. I I don't uh, see here no irony. For example, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see here uh, no uh, uh, minority uh, minority activities. I think uh, this uh, building uh, this uh, as a uh, grand narrative buildings mm -hmm. and uh, Catalan. Mm -hmm. uh, festival started before mm -hmm. postmodernity, official mm -hmm. postmodernity time. Mm -hmm. But uh, Latin uh, uh, festival is after. Mm -hmm. But why? <laughs> why it is uh, uh, postmodern? Mm -hmm. Maybe now I think that we had also kind of <clears throat> folk festivals before the, the political, because mm -hmm. I remember that yeah. something all kind of uh, uh, conferences and festivals connected with uh, 
<coughs> clinic youth movement, mm -hmm. but also Estonian movement, they were before the mm -hmm. Baltics and also Livonian long, streets. Long before. Yeah, long before. Yeah. Uh, also Livo lives who uh, visited Estonia mm -hmm. as Finnic Ubrick National mm -hmm. Group. They had a very good, uh, actually strongly nationalistic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, groups before mm -hmm. all kind of Baltic, Baltic yeah. lands. Mm -hmm. We are maybe it's before the postmodernity, but mm -hmm. it's a good idea to have kind of postmodernism as a as a frame for mm -hmm. for contemporary movements. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think yeah, it's, maybe it's uh, it's productive. We can talk about uh, uh, about. Uh, thank you. Uh, talk about uh, influence. Mm -hmm. on on uh, festivals mm -hmm. and I think it's a different form uh, in on the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, I think our days mm -hmm. well thank you actually uh, it's for me it's, it's very difficult to fully explain this idea of postmodernism within this this, this short uh, presentation and actually my my thesis was more in depth with this but this is actually this is this was a proposal, and I'm actually now trying to make uh, more sense of it because I would like to turn my PhD into a monograph. So mm -hmm. I want to explore in depth this idea, and I know that it's a bit controversial. But my idea was that the the kind of international folk festival that format was from postmodernity, mm -hmm. a postmodern phenomenon, and I thought it was interesting to explore this dimension, right? And, but of course, this is something that has still to be developed, and that, of course, um, within this presentation, it looks very simplistic because <laughs> I don't have the time to present uh, everything that, that um, all of my findings. But thank you, anyways, because for me, this is a sign that um, this aspect should be. Uh, explore more in depth and actually this is my intention so thank you very much for the feedback and i think we have questions from um, mm -hmm. Tim. Yeah. Right? Yeah. so mm -hmm. i i see checks and tina and others maybe yeah oh, uh, we'll have yeah. nasty uh -huh. and irina right she also yeah. raised her hands irina Sedakova and others so, maybe maybe mm -hmm. have questions so go ahead please Okay, uh, first, thank you for the talk. I hope you can hear me, do you? Yes, we can hear you. Um, and I was wondering, um, because I I don't know much about these two particular festivals, but I know that at many folk festivals, um, <laughs> the nations actually celebrate not just their national culture or, I don't know, bonding of Mm -hmm. several national cultures as you presented but also more like local cultural traditions um mm -hmm. i don't know in latvia it would be livonian tradition for example or some other like, regions of latvia um so i was uh, i was curious about the festivals where you that you have um studied so was it also the case that um at the beginning or maybe later during the development of this festival, uh, they celebrated and underscored this more local um, cultural traditions, or do they prefer to ignore the fact that both Catalonia and uh, Latvia are very you know, diverse um, also internally? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's, that's an excellent question. And that also allows me to expand a little bit more the, the research. And what I found out is that, for instance, the, um, the Baltica Festival had uh, always as a mission um, to, um, let's say, represent the minorities. Uh, and, and for example, um, in, in Latvia, it was very important to represent the Latvian culture, so the leaf culture. Also in the Baltica Festival, uh, in, a, in the case of Estonia, there is always a representation of all the regions that you can have, all the counties of Estonia. And there is this idea of um, developing a sensitivity towards the cultural differences within these this, uh, this regions. And 
But it's also true that when you look at the, the festival editions, each festival edition has been different in the sense that during the Sinking Revolution, there was more this idea of portraying um, obviously the local culture, but with this nexus of we are uh, the Baltic people and we have this, this distinct um, ways of doing. But once the uh, independence is achieved, um, each uh, festival edition focuses more on its own local culture. So for instance, when the festival is celebrated in Estonia, um, there is, a, there is a, a higher presence of Estonian folk participants, but there is no intention of also, um, let's say, uh, showing a lot of um, localness from, Esto from Lithuania or Latvia. So there is this sense of um, becoming a platform for showing the local folklore, but not so much the idea of Baltic folklore in terms of um, distinctions between the, the three countries. So let's say that it, this has been changing throughout time. And, and actually, in some cases in Lithuania, there, there is a high focus on the international fest of participants. They think, the organizers think that the way to maintain the engagement of the audience is by um, showcasing and, and giving special relevance to exotic, exotic uh, performances. So, for example, um, let's say folk ensembles that come from Korea or that come from India that have this um, this uh, element of distinction because they think that um, it would be very repetitive to always portray Baltic folklore for the uh, for the local audience, which is usually a recurring audience. So they go uh, they, they they visit the festival um, when it, whenever it's celebrated. And in the case of Catalonia, it's different because uh, the Sardana tradition uh, it's very um, homogeneous. Uh, and and it, there are no significant differences between Southern and Northern Catalonia. So whenever the festival is celebrated, it's a, an expression of of of, um, of Catalan uh, of a Catalan cultural practice. But there is no there is no such an idea of uh, localness. It's just that there are different folk ensembles that come from different uh, parts of Catalonia and also Northern Catalonia. Uh, but these folk ensembles have different ways of dressing. They follow, they have their own uh, their own outfits, so they can be very well differentiated. But there is no such thing as um, cultural differences in terms of regions, so to speak. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And I think we have another question from our team's audience. Uh, Irina, please. Yes, um, thank you for the lecture. I'm just curious, uh, what is the notion of intelligentsia for you? I uh -huh. thought it was uh, relevant mostly for Russian communities. Maybe I'm wrong. Is it relevant for Northern Catalonians? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So when I'm referring to intelligentsia, I'm referring to the group of people of literati, of people who are intellectuals, and that can be um, um, authors, so writers, um, folklorists, um, ethnomusicologists, so all the people that constitute an, an illustrated or educate, highly educated cluster of society and that, for instance, in cultural nationalism, they had a, a, a significant role in terms of uh, constructing the idea of, of, a, of a national culture and, and also um, developing uh, artistic movements and and so on so this is my idea when i'm talking about intelligentsia which perhaps um, might have different meanings in terms of geographical locations but it's this idea of a, of an elite of an highly educated elite 
but it's not just an, a, a highly educated elite, it's an elite that has a national consciousness and that wants to actively engage with the idea of culture, and that wants to produce culture for a purpose. I hope I have answered the question. <laughs> Well, know, maybe we have some more questions from the team's audience or from the audience here in the museum. No? So no. Okay, so if there are no more questions. No. Chat, then chat. Okay. okay. So there are no more questions. I think we can thanks again um, Aleida for being uh, with us here today. And yes, as uh, before, I think we can accompany the applause with this little present from no. the museum. <laughs> so Thanks here so much. Are. welcome again and it's my pleasure and I'm, I'm really happy to be here and I'm I'm really fond of uh, Tarto and all the tradition and all the work that you're doing the fantastic work that you're doing here and and thank you so much it means it means a lot to me thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you for attending thank you